Welcome back to the Detroit is Different podcast studios. And I'm welcoming back a very special guest to talk about something that not only impacts Detroit, but it impacts the world. And technically, you can make the interconnected change that uh, everything does. But this is really international situation. Uh, we're talking about right now the current war conflict between the Ukraine and Russia. But a lot of these seeds historically go back and fall right in the grounds of what America has done and America is doing. Uh, some of what you're going to hear in this interview, you're just not getting from the other media sources. Um, mm -hmm. And I really just want to make sure you're enlightened. Uh, after the first interview, I've been keeping a pulse and my eye on this. Uh, my father has definitely been really engaged in this, and we're talking about this because it's a lot just shifting internationally that will impact us in America, in Michigan, and in Detroit. Russ Ballant, how are you doing today? I'm welcome, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie. Thank you. So, um, so first, uh, you, you enlightened us so much about just the relationship between the Ukraine and Europe, uh, historically, uh, mm -hmm. the way that uh, the Ukraine uh, was a rest haven and just a, a home to so many uh, Aslov Nazis, uh, and, mm -hmm. and still is, uh, the way the Nazi influence influenced the Ukraine and what the Ukraine meant to Russia. Uh, this was pre-war. Uh, as it was like really starting up, like when we did mm -hmm. the interview in the beginning. Right now, we're looking at months of military actions. Um, the Ukraine has been staunchly supported by the United States of America. Uh, actually, when I see uh, my current president, uh, President Joe Biden of the United States of America, often it, between every four speeches, probably two of them are going to be about the Ukraine conflict. And the need to make sure that Ukraine wins and that Russia is stopped and Putin is possibly overthrown for aggressing against the Ukraine. Um, and that's what I'm getting from the American media, but from some international media that I'm following from India, South Africa, Ghana, China, uh, definitely what I can get that's in English from, from Russia itself, it's, it's a different spin on what's happening and why it's happening right. and the advancements. Because, you know, from American media, it, you look at it as if, like, the Ukraine has decimated every Russian soldier and Russia's reaching out and, and, and calling for a draft for, for anybody between the age of 18 and 65. If you got able bodies and legs, you're going to be in the Russian military. Mm-hmm doesn't seem to be so much the truth when I look at some of the other media. And then also, while they're losing this war, they've instilled an election. They've, mm -hmm. they've annexed, meaning like basically parts of the Ukraine now have been accepted and voted in to Mother Russia. So now Russia has expanded into certain eastern regions of the Ukraine, mm -hmm. extending the border of Russia where... Uh, President Biden has not honored this as part of Russia. And really, I guess, if, if at a United Nations abroad said, like, look, we're, we, we're, we don't honor it in any way. So I'm giving a lot of details, and I have more mm -hmm. details as I've been following it. But uh, let's start this first thing. Mm -hmm. What's happening uh, just in this state of, in state of this war? You know, how should we be looking at this as we watch the media as Americans? Well, first of all, um it's not a war of uh, Ukraine versus Russia. It's a mm -hmm. war of NATO versus Russia mm -hmm. using Ukrainian soldiers as proxies for Western uh, goals well, that go well beyond um, who controls Donetsk or Luhansk or any of those regions or, and Crimea. It's, a, it's really a war about the geopolitical alignments and uh, trying to put Russia back into a uh, more submissive relationship that the rest of Europe has with the United States. So <coughs> as you, you enlighten so many of us about the role NATO plays, because mm -hmm. in, in any 
geography class or like history class, you, you read about NATO and NATO seems like, oh, this is a organization that's an alliance amongst nations so they can trade a lot better. Uh, it, it, it seems like a, mm-hmm. a economic agreement, almost like a chamber of commerce for nations. But you enlightened us so much that NATO really was an alliance and allegiance of a lot of nations against the growth of what could happen in Russia post World War Two, almost as like it was a let's make sure Russia does not expand after this World War Two victory. Originally in 1949, NATO was founded as a uh, presumed military cooperative alliance in the event that there was a war with the Soviet Union yeah. uh, as it existed in that period of time. Now, uh, let's remember that the United States had just fought a war on the European continent with the Soviet Union in alliance, Britain, United States, and the Soviet Union defeated the Nazi forces. Um, two-thirds of the German army were defeated by the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. But the Soviet Union lost 30 million people to the massive murderous uh, operations of the, of the SS and all its uh, uh, eth- ethnic arms, the Hungarian Arrow Cross, the Bulgarian Legion, the uh, Croatian Ustashi, Spain, Spain's Blue Legions. They put 100,000 troops into the war uh, on, in alliance with Germany. Uh, the Ukrainian Nazis uh, covered uh, that whole uh, region uh, supporting uh, the m- military operations. They, f- they f- helped form an SS division working under the Waffen SS of the German Nazi Party. They... Um, massacred, they had a systemic, systematic policy of exterminating the Galatian Poles that lived there to make it, quote, pure Ukrainian, which means it's a, you know, uh, a racialist term that were, was in sync with the German Nazi racialism. They murdered a million and a half Jews, uh, as well as other groups, uh, uh, gypsies, Russians, and so forth, plus some Ukrainians themselves who wouldn't uh, ally themselves with the Nazi forces. So they, <coughs> uh, this history, uh, murderous history, the Soviet Union fought all of these nations, mm-hmm. um, and I've left some of them out, Hungary, uh, mm-hmm. I, I mentioned, but um, Romania, the Romanian Iron Guard was part of the SS. And you know we have some local history with that because when all these SS units were defeated, the United States met with them and recruited that SS whole SS fabric into its military political operations and resettled many of them into the United States and set up emigrate political groups led by the wartime Nazis. Yeah. And I, I wrote a book about this. Um, and... Um, you know, it was hard to get media coverage on it. The New York Times did do, let me write an op-ed about that, and uh, 60 Minutes was interested, and then the White House got them to shut the story down. Mm-hmm. See, so, you know, um, n- this will go back to our contemporary media discussion, <laughs> you know, yeah. about how, how the message is controlled to the public. But the, the... W- the United States immediately turned on the Soviet Union, despite their massive losses and their critical role in in the defeat uh, of uh, the third th- of the Axis powers of World War II, Italy, Japan, and and Germany. Mm-hmm. So um, they they were uh, and you know they kept saying, well, you know th- these uh, these Soviets are bent on world conquest. And so forth. Now, when you lose 30 million people, and and you're, uh, you know, thousands of square miles are just devastated, and towns and villages are exterminated, um, you are trying to recover. <laughs> and so, you know, that, that that's what we did. And we've been b- basically in that posture about that land mass, but we fam- framed it as anti-communism, not because it was a communist uh, 
led by communist parties. And, but now it's clear that it, w it was always strategically about the region and, you know, not, and having the unipolar world where we dominated every element of the continent. And, and since our last, since our last exchange, uh, mm -hmm. our last interview, a um, couple of things have happened. Uh, one of the key things when you enlightened us on that is uh, uh, late President Gorbachev has passed away. Mm -hmm. And as he as he broke uh, the USSR, the 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 deal was always that NATO was not supposed to move any further east mm -hmm. towards the Russian border. That was the agreement. And since then. Russia has has always had to deal with NATO moving further and further and further closer to the Russian border. Mm -hmm. So for Americans uh, watching this information, you can think of this kind of in the same way as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. It would be as if, uh, you know, I don't even know who we want to posture as an enemy, but if, if, if the Bahamas aligned itself with China mm -hmm. and China wanted to set up missiles in the Bahamas, in a, in a uh, I guess, like a, whatever, what would we say, like a military basis. Right. America would probably be having the same, if not more aggressive, war actions against the Bahamas mm -hmm. and pseudo-China mm -hmm. for doing an act like that. But NATO, um, it, it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of information that, that mm -hmm. now it, it, it is like uh, just coming across it, and we're also getting a better understanding about the Ukraine and its region. So that's really the, the next question I have for you. The first thing was uh, estimate of a timeline of this war uh, and this yeah. conflict. Yeah, and it, it's really hard to estimate because uh, even as more people, uh, the population of Ukraine emigrate out, mm -hmm. um, they're going to continue to use the uh, Ukrainian military as a front, and at some point, if it's not capable, there will be some kind of, in my view, there will be some kind of pretext for expanding uh, to the use of non-NATO for uh, non-Ukrainian forces from NATO into the war. Um, it, besides Ukraine, they, they do use some proxy forces from outside. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, in, in, on, on, you, on the NATO side, and um, uh, you know the the build the increased buildup of NATO um, in from Scandinavia. They're trying to uh, Turkey. Uh, you you just look at the map back in back when the Soviet Union was around. There were 15 countries in NATO. Mm -hmm. Now it's over 30. Well, NATO s should have gone out of business when, when the Soviet yeah. Union uh, basically collapsed, you mm -hmm. know, uh, or, or you know, um, just dissolved itself. And what, you know, this, I mean, this is, there's, this is a long history. If you go back to ancient Greece, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Athenians uh, in the city-state, the powerful city-state of Athens, formed something called the Delian League to create an alliance against Persia, which was the competing power at the time. And after Persia was defeated, the Delian League was converted to the Athenian Empire. <laughs> yeah. And so Athens controlled all those people who were nominally their allies. And NATO is the same. Um, Angela Merkel basically said that when uh, Trump was president, you know, we're used to taking direction from the United States. In mm -hmm. other words, the United States tells Europe what to do <laughs> when it comes yeah. to the, the geopolitical things. Now, there are issues where they don't, they have once in a while disagreed at the United Nations, but for the most part, the United States really tells them what to do. Um, and, I mean, let's face it, uh, I, was, I was in NATO when uh, I was drafted. They talk about all these con conscripting and forcing all these people. Well, guess what? I was conscripted, too, when we had something called the Vietnam War. <laughs> and, mm. um, and so I was over there, and, uh, you know, uh, millions, millions of uh, 
men in the United States were conscripted to go to a war in, in Vietnam where we had no reason to be there other than uh, to continue to extend our military economic power in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, uh, you know, I, I would scratch my head sometimes and I could tell that there were Germans that felt like, why has the United States got a military force and why are we seeing their tanks and artillery and trucks and uniforms all over Germany, uh, yeah. you know, 25 years after the war is over, you know, um, and, um, you know, and I was always told, um, you know, by officers that, you know, we're here if a war breaks out. And I was in an airborne unit, which would have been the first one to be deployed if it was. And I said, well, what would we do? They said, we'd go to a prearranged site and then, then we um, bring out the nuclear weapons. Now, that, that brings us to, um, I, I was asking about the state of the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, let, oh, let me, yeah, I let did me, let, me <laughs> ask you, let me ask you about the state of Russia, too. Uh, mm -hmm. what, where are things, what do you see? You, you, you did uh, give us that information, but, and, I, and I love the way that you offer more context to it, especially historical context. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, and, and you're saying that as more citizens are leaving, uh, the troops are staying, obviously, and mm -hmm. more troops um, from different uh, mercenary groups and, mm -hmm. and and definitely a lot of arms that America we're, we're 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 clearly seeing facing this recession that we're in in America. Mm -hmm. We're sending billions of dollars. It looks like almost weekly to the Ukraine mm -hmm. for this conflict. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did not see uh, Joe Biden being such a, 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 a warring president. I guess I should have, like, been more abreast to his historical past being this. I, I, did, I had no idea that it would mm -hmm. spark like this, but he is dead set on this and sending a lot of resources at a time when clearly America has a lot of economic instability. Uh, but with that, wh what's happening in Russia right now? What, what's the state of Russia? Well, I, I don't consider myself well informed on that subject. Okay. But I, uh, I think that um, <coughs> uh, right now, see, the, the United States has built in political infrastructure in Russia. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not powerful, but it's present. Okay. And um, the, the United States run something called the National Endowment for Democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and the Reagan administration formed this organization to, you know, publicly fund news media, uh, political groups, and so forth in countries across the globe. So, so and really so they they've had this presence in Russia. So, like, really a wing of propaganda mm -hmm. that was uh, this is kind of out of a lot of like in war, as people don't know. Propaganda is a big part of war because mm -hmm. hearts and minds move where the people, uh, what the people agree or don't agree with. <coughs> well. Hence, I, I really don't think a lot of Americans agree with America sending so much money to support this Ukrainian conflict, which I guess we'll kind of get to that in a second. But, you know, it's hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. it's, you know? It is hearts and minds. And, um, and uh, but at the same time, when, it, when we understand it's propaganda, uh, mm -hmm. I just always remind people that the first casualty of war is the truth. The first casualty of war is truth. Wow, that's yeah. deep. And, um, I, you know, and I, and I didn't originate that. I don't remember who did, mm. but, you know, it sticks with me. And um, the, uh, uh, the way that Ukraine is being portrayed and Russia is being portrayed is different uh, than the way it was just, you know, prior to, say, 2013. Uh, you may remember that when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, uh, a guy named Boris Yeltsin became the premier, and mm -hmm. Boris Yeltsin had been cultivated by American right-wing groups. They, they had it, were operating in Russia 
when Gorbachev, uh, when the Soviet Union existed, and Gorbachev was the premier there. Uh, the Paul Weyricks and the uh, James Dobson's and those who we think of in terms of formulating the American far right wing, mm. they were operating in Russia and they recruited Boris Yeltsin and they taught them how to e do election engineering and election propaganda and manipulating elections to win. They taught them uh, the whole strategy of elections as Russia was transforming to into an elected base uh, instead of a, um, a Soviet uh, uh, basing um, Soviet power. And so uh, Boris Yeltsin put as one of his aides uh, Vladimir Putin. And when uh, Boris Yeltsin decided to step down, he said Putin is the guy who's going to run this country. Mm -hmm. and, uh, th and that was done in concert with the American right wing. Putin was never, uh, you know, they say, well, he's a KGB K, uh, KBB, KGB agent and so forth. Yeah, that was true. He was also uh, not necessarily a, a well-respected one. And so, uh, <coughs> you know, but he took over and they started working with the United States and they did joint denuclearization programs. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, R Russia and the United States created the joint space program where, where they were operating the space station together, still are. Uh, in this joint program, and we're working jointly uh, with their influences, e separate influences in different parts of the Middle East to bring more peace and stability in the Middle East. And uh, Putin was characterized for many years as a positive force and an ally of the United States, a cooperator, I won't yeah. say an ally. Uh, <coughs> and then when uh, it came to you know, events in the Ukraine, the United States had been running operations ever since the collapse of the Union, primarily through the organization of Ukrainian Nazis. They, they call it organization of Ukrainian nationalists, mm -hmm. the Banderist forces. These are mm -hmm. the ones that l were created the SS divisions. These are the ones that did the extermination programs in World War II. Absolutely shameless, murderous history. When when the U.S. allied forces and parties were being created, uh, statues went up honoring Bandera, the head of the Nazis of the Ukraine. He was the Hitler of Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, a, a, really a psychotic mass murderer was really what he was um, until he died in '59, and um, and so. Um, th those forces became very strong because they had been linked since World War II and they were, uh, were uh, to the United States intelligence agencies that were created in, uh, in the post-war period. And so the, uh, they operated out of Munich, which was the headquarters of Radio Free Europe, and that's how, where they linked all these groups. That's how they funded them, through the Radio Free Europe operations. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> and they ran intelligence operations and missions uh, where the radio, just like during the French Resistance in World War II, the French Resistance listened to the British radio to get the signals that they needed for doing operations, uh, you know, the launch of D-Day and so forth. And so all this was going on. Well, these parties started to emerge, and... Uh, all of a sudden, you started seeing in the 90s, started seeing people trying to glorify the Nazi past. Mm -hmm. And these statues went up all over uh, Ukraine, as I said, you know, on, you know, big statues of Bandera, the Hitlerite. And they still are there today. And just recently, the uh, Andr Melnik, who is the uh, Ukraine, Zelensky's Ukraine ambassador of Ukraine to Germany told Germany, you've got, you have to honor Stefan Bandera. Mm. You know, you, I, you know, this, this, this is important. You must honor him. Well, Melnik is a top leader of the Ukrainian Nazis in, Ger in Germany. Yeah. Uh, uh, in Ukraine, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, and peop people just don't, have been, you know, they used to say when Russia's charged that uh, 
Ukraine was a neo-Nazi state. Well, no, he's a Jew. That isn't possible. It's just propaganda. Russia this and this is it. Well, when Zelensky went to went to um, Greece uh, or, or was uh, brought in, in, into the parliament, a special session of parliament to address the situation in Ukraine, um, uh, the only person he brought with him, and he never told him in advance that he was going to do this, he brought one of the top uh, Azov leaders, uh, uh, or representatives, I should say, to uh, speak after he gave his memo thing. He said, now I want you to hear from blah, 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 wh yeah. whatever his name was. Hmm. And uh, he said, he was described as the top uh, Azov leader. Wow. And members, some members of parliament walked out. I'm sure. And they were I indignant because it was, it was, it was just uh, disrespectful. Disrespectful. Thank you. Yeah, it would be like bringing yeah. for for, for mm -hmm. black people watching. It would be like bringing a, a Ku Klux Klan member. Yeah, that's right. A leader to yeah. <laughs> to a to a Detroit uh, black leadership council or, or like exactly. it, well, it, it, you know a community yeah. leaders event. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of yeah. black folks would walk. I know I would walk out. Right. You know, right. I'm not about right. to sit and listen to a Grand Wizard talk. Exactly. And yeah. then I'm also gonna lose respect for who brought the Grand Wizard in the first place. Right. Right. But. Uh, but Greece has a powerful far right, uh, just yes. as uh, all of Europe does. Uh, the Golden Dawn, and even though some of its leaders were jailed, uh, it's experiencing a revival in Greece. And uh, Golden Dawn, they were murderers. Uh, th they were in jail. They were committing murders all over the place of people they considered political opponents, you know, people that they had political chasms and differences with. And, um, you know, y you see this rise across Europe. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of people think that Z Zelensky, they're, they're being engineered to believe that Zelensky is a beleaguered national hero who wants fairness and justice. And, and, and this is, uh, let, me, let me get into a little yeah. bit of my media training about Zelensky. Yes. First off, um, I do know his history as a comedian and an actor, but let's 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 disregard that. Let's right. let's stick to specifically like just the images of when you see him. They have him usually in a t-shirt. They usually have him slumped over like uh, so like just in the world of video. I don't know if people pay attention to this, but in video you can do like up shots and down shots. Mm -hmm. Like a down shot is usually the shot that they capture him with. Now I know I'm sounding like all extra like uh you know, you're thinking I'm going too detailed, like the, the O.J. Simpson photo when they made him look more scruffed up and stuff like that. But all of this does have a psychological effect on how it is. When I do an upshot, if I do a downshot on a subject, it makes you feel as though this person is a little bit more docile. They're in need of help. They're, 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 they're uh, you know, they're... They are needing your support. If I do an upshot, hence, if you look at most, you know, presidential stuff, even going back to a lot of, I mean, speaking about propaganda and Nazis, most pictures you have of Hitler giving any speech as short of a man he is, it's an upshot. Because looking up towards someone, it mm -hmm. has a mental impact on how, what you're going to, the impact of what this person is saying. Even versus, like, just straight on, a straight on shot, you're, like, it's certain things manipulating even the way Zelensky is speaking so it's like you know and knowing that um, knowing that he has American allies and some of the best when it comes to like media deception and propaganda uh, since the Nazi regime helping with this this is all designed mm -hmm. he's not coming to speak to the the UN via video in a t-shirt because it's so crazy and all I got is a t-shirt but that's the inception of what they want you to think they want you to think He's so uh, disheveled and he's so beaten by this bully that I don't even have time to go put on a suit, mm -hmm. especially when we see his wife on 60 Minutes in a white suit. That's that's also a mm -hmm. very uh, strategic media training, you know, mm -hmm. woman, white suit, uh, white or like skirt, suit set, cross cross legs uh, like and then from there, like uh, the, the way they put the 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 fading imagery around her and what that means. This is all gathering more sympathy mm -hmm. for a person 
without even something being said. Because mm-hmm. we know that you can't understand what he's saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what you're interpreting with what he's saying through body language and imagery is he needs help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hence, he needs help. We should be okay mm-hmm. sending another billion dollars worth of missiles and money and weapons to them. The other elephant in this room that I'm coming to find out, which makes sense, is the Ukraine has been a very unstable nation for a while. Yes. It's, it's been one of what people would label as one of the more, and it's tough because I'm in America, so I guess you could label any, definitely this nation, one of the more corrupt, mm-hmm. uh, corrupting, uh, one of the more paying people off, uh, even when we think of the relationship between Hunter Biden and the energy company there. Mm-hmm. But it's not just Hunter Biden. It's many other world leaders where you, Ukrainian uh, corporate officials and business people would just openly say, yeah, we bribe people. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, it's, it's just like, this is like open information that I'm finding out. That the Ukraine oh, yeah. has been a hotbed for a lot of um, nefarious activity. That's right. From the government down. Yeah. Hence, I, I, I'm i even getting reports from certain, uh, getting reports, hearing reports. I'm sounding like I'm on the wire or something. From <laughs> some of the stuff that I get from, like, uh, so, like, uh, Wilmer Leon is is one of the, the people that my dad will send me some things on. Um, uh, Garland, Dick, uh, Garland uh, Nixon. Um, it's uh, it's, it's uh, T, I think it's, like, TFI. It's, like, an Indian news outlet. Um there are other uh, Gerald Horn. Um, it, it's it's some it's some information out there, but all of this stuff is Googleable. Uh, that is certain American officials that feel like maybe some of these arms and the monies and things that are being sent to the Ukraine are kind of like you know they're getting intercepted, as we saw in the Afghanistan conflict. And so like it, it's getting to the Ukraine, but it's no telling that the Ukraine is actually using those weapons. The Ukraine is turning around and putting that back mm-hmm. on the black market. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's like a like a rock in a hard place because this mm-hmm. country has such a a, 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 a a strong history of of this happening. And the other nation that it's next to, Turkey has a strong history of that too. Like right. this region since and it makes sense. Like I guess the instability of uh, Western powers and I guess Eastern powers looking to um, build alliances mm-hmm. in that whole region around the Black Sea has made it uh, a, 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 an advantageous position to possibly play both sides. And they're building NATO. They're trying to get other countries, not not even in the continental Europe, to be part of NATO. They're trying to make it a mm-hmm. world military alliance. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, and, and the imaging that you're talking about, uh, I, I bringing back my recollection about uh, the fact that there were 150 public relations firms, primarily from the United States, that were operating in Kiev when this war was launched to, and the war Wait, wasn't. Talk about, talk about, talk about. We gonna repeat that one again. How yeah. many? A hundred and fifty public relations PR firms. firms. Yes. Now you know the Ukrainian government wasn't paying for those. Yeah. Y- you know. If, it, if I'm it, about it, to it, go it, to war, the last thing that I'm probably doing is calling up. Um, I don't even know who's the big PR person, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not calling up uh, LeBron James team. Like, hey mm-hmm. man, I really like that commercial. You think you can come over here and help push yeah. this war? <laughs> yeah. And so they started really churning the stuff out. Every mm-hmm. image coming out of Ukraine the uh, Ukraine uh, uh, war is is engineered through public relations, what they call STRATCOM. That, I mean, this is what they themselves call it, not me. It's STRATCOM, Strategic communications. communications. And everything is engineered. Every photograph, every news story, every news line is being engineered through this public relations instrumentality. And, you know, I mean, this is really being funded through U.S. covert funds, and uh, it's meant to convey a continuing image. You will he, let's talk about some stories you won't hear from through the American media let's about go. that. Um, one, you're not going to hear that in 2014, the Kiev regime 
after the, a U.S. coup, and it's documented, well documented in Europe. The United States overthrew, and some uh, European leader said it at the time. The United States overthrew the elected government of Ukraine because they they would not take orders from the United States and installed mm -hmm. the pro-Nazi Poroshenko. I mean, his his wife was one of the leaders of the Ukrainian Nazis in the United States. She ran operations for him. She was an aide to Ronald Reagan. Um, and um, they installed him. And when this happened, the you, uh, they banned the Russian language. They banned uh, in oral communications, written communications, uh, news outlets, anything. Uh, it was to be totally banned because as you as a Ukrainian Nazi, you don't want anything in Ukraine except quote pure Ukrainianism. So, so for people that don't know, that didn't watch the first interview, you got into that yes deeper yes. in the first one. But I like right. we're revisiting that so that we can frame this. I just yes. want to frame it. That's right. Um, so, so people kind of have an understanding. In 2014, right. you had. Uh, I, and now there, there are clips coming out. It, it, yep. it was a special clip of a, of a uh, sitting advisor to then uh, President, I think it, he was a sitting advisor to President Bush. Um, and then eventually did some advising for President Obama. And he was on like the Stephen Colbert's Colbert Report back when, mm -hmm. you know, he was on Comedy Central and not uh, mm -hmm. today. But, uh, and they're even joking about it where he's jokingly saying we need the Ukraine to pick the side of America and not the side of Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was in the interest mm -hmm. of, of America to, to, to have Ukraine as an asset. And it also, as, as more reports are coming up from Condoleezza Rice, even speaking of when we think of international diplomacy mm -hmm. and even like Joe Biden about Ukraine needs to join NATO. Mm -hmm. But it was always said that like, look, do not come further east because if NATO comes further east, Russia is going to accept that as uh, an act of war. Yes. So with that, Ukraine is right there at the border. Mm -hmm. And 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 so people can understand, like the breakup of the USSR broke Russia into different states. It would be like mm -hmm. if if America broke up. And I don't know what this would become. If this becomes mm -hmm. part of Canada, if, if Michigan becomes part of Canada, I'm still going to live in Detroit. But, you know, other mm -hmm. uh, other the, the other part of America, let's say America picks up in Illinois or something. It, my family in Illinois knows I'm still here in Detroit. and They still love me. It's a mm -hmm. lot of it was a lot of you. Ukrainian Russians, as mm -hmm. strange as it sounds, mm -hmm. that lived in the Ukraine, right. but they aligned with Russian idealism. They aligned with uh, Russian uh, mm -hmm. uh, Russian history. They culturally mm -hmm. responded to Russia, but they lived in the Ukraine and they wanted to stay in the Ukraine yeah. as long as it could be stable. So, like that Eastern Bloc of the Ukraine that they're that they're saying is annexed on behalf of Russia, really were people that align more with. Russian idealism well, anyway. Yeah, let's really talk about okay. that because after this 2014 coup, and I, we're talking about months now, the Ukrainian military, the, the Ukrainian Nazis that had been used in the street demonstrations, the yeah. New York Times identified them. They did a big story about these Ukrainian Nazis who were the, the street muscle, that's their term, mm -hmm. the street muscle for the protests that overthrew the president. Uh, and, of course, they were instrumentalities of the U.S. intelligence agencies. And so th they overthrew the president. They were then uh, moved into areas and trained militarily. And instead of using Molotov cocktails and bombs and bat baseball bats, they were given artillery, tanks, and heavy weaponry of every sort and in intense training. And they were moved to the east. Because the people in the East were saying, we do not want to live under a Nazi regime, this unelected regime. Units of the Ukrainian army defected from the government after the coup. And when they saw that the Ukrainian military was moving East, and they start, because the Ukrainian military started bombing and uh, artillery shelling and street, uh, street operations, pulled all the power utilities, water utilities, and started killing these people. 
in huge numbers. The United Nations estimated that 14,000 people were killed. Mm -hmm. Today, in the war we're talking about today, um, the estimate is that uh, since the, uh, Russia uh, invaded, that 7,000 people have been killed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Ukrainians out in uh, Kiev, the people that are our heroes and our models, are the ones that were the mass m doing the mass murder in that regime. And a lot of the photographs that come out about, you know, apartment buildings in here, you know, being blown yeah. up and stuff like that, that stuff was from the stuff that the Ukrainian 20, military did. Okay? From 2014. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and 15 and beyond. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I found people, well, I, I never heard that from anybody else. They doubt whether it's true. I just tell them. Google the uh, Minsk agreements and the Minsk protocols, those terms. The European Union was trying to bring a stop to it. This is, this is back in the time when uh, Victoria Nuland, and, uh, who was Assistant Secretary of State for Obama and, and was working under the direct control of Joe Biden in, mm -hmm. in 2014, uh, said, F the EU, you know, we're not – you know, we don't want anything to do with them. The, the U.S. is taking, you know, basically taking charge yeah. and so forth. So this war went on. Now, eventually it was uh, toned down because, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, for a variety of reasons. But in February 16th of this year, the Ukrainian military went back and started shelling and bombing again. And, that and it was, was it was mm -hmm. eight days later that the Russians came to the uh, defense. Mm -hmm. Th that's how I see it. I don't and I don't get I don't really care who likes it. Yeah, that's what happened. And 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 so people understand it would be like Canadians looking at the, in that same example. Like, mm -hmm. and I'm just using this as an mm -hmm. example. So Canadians saying like, hey, all these Detroiters aren't really with mm -hmm. Canada, so we're gonna kill them anyway. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then. People in America saying, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not about to let that happen. Is if We went into that deeper of, mm -hmm. like, what sparked it up. But this, uh, the Ukraine has been unstable. It, it's It's been a lot of things for a while. Right. But a lot of it has definitely been pushed by on, on both factions because it's kind of <laughs> torn between aligning with America mm -hmm. and aligning with Russia mm -hmm. and, 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 and making a decision between both. And you also pointed out... It, it's also in the shadows of what's happening throughout Europe. Now, I, I want to get to the Europe point because European leaders mm -hmm. have, have been, in certain ways, definitely influenced and almost like are, are now being like influenced to really draw lines, but especially yes. after we look at what happened when we really know like right now, a, a lot of people are very aware that the Nordstrom pipeline that uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that had a had a leak. It looks like uh, most 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 yes. news outlets across the world are reporting that that looks like America bombed both pipeline one, which was what was going to Germany. But Germany said, you know what? America says, you know, we, we got to function. We got to cut all ties with Russia, so we will. And and that provides, like, 50% of the energy to Germany. Mm -hmm. And they also had a second line, meaning, like, it was just in case something happens to line one, we got a line two. Both lines were bombed. Right. And so people can understand this. In NATO waters, there were three naval, like, drone submarines doing some testing right around the time when both these pipelines get bombed. Mm -hmm. So this is just very convenient so people can understand, like, if it, it, it'd be like if, uh, you know, if if DTE is outside your house working on, the, like, I guess the power line at, at like, 10 o'clock at night, and then your power goes out at 11 o'clock, and then you call DTE like, hey, I think you guys just uh, turned my power off. And then they're like, Psh, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. So... The rest of the world is definitely seeing this and reporting this. A lot of media outlets across the world, because it's just known <laughs> that America was doing these submarine-like drone missions 
in in these NATO yep. waters, right where this Nordstrom pipeline was. Yep. And it also aligns with uh, Joe Biden gave a speech. I want to say it was back in um, maybe like a month ago where he said, hey, Germany really can't even think about turning that power back on because Germany, as German citizens, are in talks with what they are being prepped for, saying like it'll be an energy crisis in Europe that Europe has not seen since a long time. Yeah, And yeah. it's like, why don't you just turn this power back on instead of us dealing with this energy crisis? That was what a lot of German citizens were saying. Now right. you bomb both pipelines, you don't even have that option. And who ben who's going to benefit? It's going to be the American liquefied natural gas industry that was sending shiploads of liquefied natural gas to Germany to try and replace the Russian sourcing. So the American petrochemical industry or parts of it will be the ones also benefiting. We we should remember that um, there's a huge arms industry in the United States that's getting rich off of this war, mm -hmm. there, but the, also the petrochemical. And look at what's happened to our gas prices. They're ba going back up again. You know, all this started after the um, the Ukrainian operations. And, uh, you know, we're, pay we're paying a price too, nothing compared to what the losses are going on in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we talk, I, I did want to also mention because the, the, all the, there's a lot of talk about sham uh, referendums on the uh, annexation and so forth, and it's not recognized, it's not constitutional, and so forth. Um, let's put a little historical perspective on that. Okay. Because th the idea of creating uh, annex, uh, annexation was started in Europe when Bill Clinton was president. Uh, the United States waged a war against Yugoslavia and broke it up into six countries. And um, uh, I mean, th the, the Europe, Europe made a decision to do that, but primarily the United States. And Yugoslavia was a socialist country at that time. And the, um, uh, the Western f uh, financial interests went in and without even a legal process, uh, started o taking all the state industries and privatizing it in their name with mm -hmm. without you know just because they could and uh and, and getting rich off of it but th they created a country called kosovo <laughs> which never existed you, but they had a rump parliament make a vote to create kosovo and that was considered enough legitimacy a sh veneer of legitimacy to recognize this as a sovereign state. Mm -hmm. um, and that was what the West did, primarily the United States. Now, and when this was challenged in international court, um, the United States uh, took, the position, took the position that this was l legitimate. And uh, eventually, the Western courts, being under the pressure they were, uh, accepted it. So when in 2014 in Crimea, when the, the Russians were in there, they said, we're, gonna, we're not going to just declare it. We're going to do a referendum. And they did a referendum, and 90-plus percent of the people voted that, to break away from Ukraine. Again, this is be after the coup, after the ban on Russian language, after the hostility mm -hmm. uh, coming from Kiev. And they voted 90-plus percent to separate and the same messages were coming from uh, West through Western media and s f officials uh, this is sham you know nobody gets 90 percent of nothing and they sent in uh, polling uh, from the United States the State Department sent agencies other European countries sent and they did uh, deep social surveys and they came back and said guess what 90 plus percent really did want to do yeah. this okay now, you go over into uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, they're doing the same thing. They said, these are sham people were made to vote at gunpoint and so forth. Maybe somebody was, maybe not. Maybe that was a creation. Maybe that was something, you know, that was created in a strategic communications PR firm. But th here's the facts. The, the Kiev 
government had been killing and bombing these people yeah. for six years. Yeah. It cut off your u utilities and made them live. The president of Ukraine said at the end of 2014, he said, the war in the East, the way we're going to win it is we're cutting all their power. We're going to go in there and make it so that if they want to stay alive, they're going to have to live in a basement. Yeah. And they had snipers all over there, and they were randomly snipers. There's a great French documentary that was done on it. It was converted into English subtitles. And it tells the whole tragic story in a several-hour documentary of how these people were lives were totally. If they had a voice, you, you know what they would have voted yeah. for. So this 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 idea that it's a sham is automatic reaction, you know, because you can't concede that these people were heavily persecuted. Yes, and, and so people understand what the annexing is in that concept, and, and we're there now because we talked about the pipeline. And I do want to go back to that because yeah. this kind of goes to the rest of Europe being impacted by this too, mm -hmm. which will impact and will which will impact America definitely because American business is worldwide, and we know corporations influence a lot of America. Now, um, annexing is basically the the nation state deciding to you know voting to join Russia, and what's unique is right now America's so polarized. I think if a lot of America America could annex itself from America. That vote would be a lot of people choosing to still stay here, but definitely align with other nations just because it's like they don't like mm -hmm. the, the the makeup of what's happening in America, just so that people are aware. So th this this was, a as I had to think about it and look and talk to my dad and, and review, this was a real interestingly savvy political move by the Russian government. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say Putin himself, but the mm -hmm. administration. Because by basically accepting these, I guess, provinces or uh, uh, city, states, uh, state uh, uh, of Ukraine into Russia now, now that makes it where if any bomb or any any mission or any operation now continues to happen out east there, mm -hmm. they're looking that as that at that as a direct attack on Russia soil, mm -hmm. and within their rights, which goes into the next point of possibly using nuclear attacks. Or whatever other weaponry as they organize and mm -hmm. things like that, which I'm not for. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm against all war, but it we have to pay attention to things like this because mm -hmm. war, as people know, I'm very interested in economics, is uh, to me, it's an economic strategy. That's right. the reason why people go to war or, or right. nations go to war. It's over economics. It's controlling resources and trying to control the flow of certain resources or where other nations can get resources, people can interact and engage. I'm for... People being having flat markets and people should be able to trade wherever and however they would want. But that leaves certain people out. Like even as you say now, Europe's going to have to rely on America shipping oil from American ships, which we already are so unstable as much as we consume and use. America can't, uh, in my mind, America does not have the capacity to supply even in a money state. Germany with oil, as Germany through that pipeline would supply France with oil, Italy with oil, it opens up other nations in Europe to say, to not say, okay, let's go to America. Mm -hmm. It's going to open them up to do other things, and it's also going to suppress a lot of currencies. It's going to cause a lot of other atrocities. This is why the German people were like, look, turn the pipeline back on so we don't have to deal with this what 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 media and American media is heavy on this. They're bracing Europe for one of the worst winters to be coming through war Europe ever. As far as their energy prices, they say will go up like what are they saying? Like maybe eight to twelve times as much in energy costs. Mm -hmm. So just think about that. Your energy, you're a German citizen, and your energy prices just went up twelve percent. Because your political leadership aligned with America saying, hey, cut off Russia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're not going to agree with that. Yeah. And, 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 and they, uh, they suffered in the climate of last winter. They're going to suffer more this winter. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when the new German uh, prime minister was elected mm -hmm. uh, as uh, head of the Social Democratic Party, 
he actually came from the Christian Democratic Party, which is, is you know, the difference between the two is like Republican and Democrat, <laughs> right? And he comes to that party, uh -huh. and then he announces we're going to align with the United States, yeah. and we're going to, listen, double the Ameri the, our military spending. J you, just as the United States is amping Japan up to become a higher military power so that they can become an ally in a military war, with China that the United States envisions. You know, this goes back to the, uh, the, the four countries that uh, the United States, Australia, Japan, and India were supposed to be this coalition uh, to take on China. At the same time, we're doing the same thing to Russia. This is a worldwide phenomenon, and this is coming out of the neocons in the State Department, the Anthony Blinkens and the Victoria Newlands, who are, um, you know, uh, if, if you're not planning a war or conducting a war, you're not doing enough to control the world. Mm. Let's remember, the United States has four to 500 military bases, depending on how you, uh, the number varies depending on how you define a base, mm -hmm. a post versus a base. Um, but a huge military empire in the world, and anybody can go online and Google U.S. military um, bases worldwide. Just go Google it. Then do the same thing for Russia. Do the same thing for China. You'll, with the United States, you'll see bases in Africa, throughout Latin America, all, the in, all over the Pacific Ocean, everywhere in the world. But you won't see that for the countries that we're uh, amping up um, yeah. confrontation with. Uh, Russia has had, uh, when I looked at it about three years ago, they had a base in Syria. Mm -hmm. and uh, nothing else outside the Federation. Now I think they have more outside, yeah. but not much more. But it's in response to the militarization of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And the United States is, is, is leading this whole worldwide militarization that's going on. So Look at the Africa Command. Why now, do we have now, an I, Africa I, Command? And I was going to get to that let's do right that. now. I, let's I, do we, it. Let's go. Because, let's do it. because so, so, and it's unique because this is also since we sp last spoke, uh, Queen Elizabeth passed away, mm -hmm. and and a lot of those African nations are galvanized to say we are going to focus on getting back the monies owed from us from the crown. So I don't know if you guys are aware of this because you know the media showed a lot of the African <laughs> leaders that were crying over her death, and yeah, it was something like that. But it was also a lot of African leaders saying, "Yep." It's time for us to get back what we got with colonization because America is taking on this new scope of, of, of mm -hmm. colonization through this uh, militarization mm -hmm. that has been in in a while. And when we speak about Africa, and this is one of the things, one of my biggest critiques against the Obama administration is the way that uh, the way that I believe the image of Barack Obama disarmed a lot of the African leaders and allowed America to militarize there. And I don't think people know this as, as in, this is something very Googleable. Uh, like it'll pop right up, mm -hmm. but most people don't are, are unaware that, that America has spent thousands of national guard troops, meaning national guard troops to Africa right now, the horn of Africa. So like Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, the places that America has been bombing almost like the same day that America was saying, how dare Russia attack the Ukraine? Mm -hmm. America began bombing Somalia. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if a lot of people know this. But Hundreds of times. Yes. Somalia, Uganda, and Sudan mm -hmm. have been in a conflict against America for a while. And now they're sending National Guard troops from New York and Wisconsin. This is a story that, and I'm I'm imagining more will be deployed there too. So when you think about this, the National Guard, an American National Guard troop, as far as I'm concerned, the National Guard, I thought, was supposed to be in the nation. And, and for defense, and, and if there was, if the United States was ever attacked, they were there for immediate mobilization. They weren't there to extend the empire and control the, every nation in the world. And that's what we're, and again, I don't care who likes it, that likes it being said. If you don't like it, go do your research. Don't tell me I'm wrong until you can show me some data that shows and some facts that shows that. Oh, you've got a demonic image of so Putin or you've got a demonic image. Of, yeah. Is it possible 
that that demonic engine was just engineered a couple over the last year or two because he wasn't doing what the United States said. Look at all the years of positive coverage when we were doing our joint programs uh, in space and denuclearization and so forth. People need to think for themselves because nobody's going to feed you the truth through the media. And, you know, and um, I, I've got decades of experience trying to tell the stories of the Nazis in the United States that were brought here from the CIA. I've through the CIA and I um, and and so many other stories, and it just gets crushed once w because at some point the media has to expose the CIA, and very few are willing to do it. They were 30, 40 years ago, not now. Let Let me ask you this: in reference to that, why is America so insistent on occupying and getting so many troops in Africa mm -hmm. right now? Africa's natural resources, as well as the Eurasian continent's resources, Latin America's resources, are all sources of power and wealth for the empire, you know. Um, and the, the empire is larger than the United States as a geographic entity. It's the economic system that uh, coheres uh, parts of West, Western Europe, North America, uh, you know, uh, as uh, one uh, European economist said, there's th three uh, investment firms in New York that control wealth, more wealth than most of the nations of Europe. Mm. Three investment firms. Mm. And these folks operate worldwide. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> and so, yeah, and people first we need to really understand how power is controlled in the United States who controls it and if you have such vast concentrations of wealth that, that uh, can that can change the e economy of a nation why aren't you seeing more written about that because <laughs> those same investors control the for-profit media operations that are called network news, that are called uh, <laughs> print journalism, <laughs> and you're not going to be told the truth. Yeah. And uh, again, I, I, I can't Im Im impress upon folks enough to do research, find other people, work with other people that want to do it. We used to ha have research collectives back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was a huge one uh, networked across North America, just looking at how the United, what the United States was doing through the Western Hemisphere, hmm. called NACLO, and uh, these were academics and activists and uh, various kinds of leaders, and they studied how the United States w had was continually keeping all of the Western Hemisphere in subordination and control through coups, oh, uh, Google Operation Condor. Uh, you know, the 1969 uh, came out of Richard Nixon, where the, where they were just overthrowing every government. Is that I mean that went back to the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, but it was systematically done, and we were putting in military dictatorships throughout the wet Western Hemisphere. Uh, the famous one was uh, uh, the anti uh, Salvador Allende coup in 1973 in Santiago in Chile, and they rounded up 30,000 people and killed them. Uh, a, a whole bunch of them, and they did the same thing in Argentina, the dirty war they called it, where they were just wiping out, exterminating political opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, connect, connect that to uh, what they learned about how, how the, WAP, the SS operated in Europe during World War II, because Richard Nixon was the guy that created the ethnic arm of the Republican Party, made up entirely of the German SS Nazis mm. from World War II. Wow. Every ethnic arm, the Bulgarian, the Bulgarian Republican clubs were run by a guy who was a leader of the Bulgarian Legion, the Hungarian Aero Cross leader that was the liaison between Hitler and the Aero Cross Nazi government of Hungary in World War II. He was the guy that organized it all. Mm. You know, and you, 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 you just see all these combinations, and the, the U.S., 
it really needs to be understood for what it has done because what they've done in the past is what they're doing now again, this time without any pretense of democracy or freedom. They're just like, we've got to stop this power over here that won't take our orders. Now, now, now with that, this is also on the precipice of something that also is not reported. It's like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm big in economics. Mm-hmm. This BRIC system, most people are unaware what this BRIC system is, mm-hmm. but there's a collective currency that really aligns a lot of nations that America's not having the best international sometimes uh, diplomacy with, but Brazil, mm-hmm. Russia, India, China, and South Africa have aligned itself to create a currency. Mm-hmm. And this is moving forward expeditiously. Yes. This currency, technically, just due to the industrial makeup of those five nations, mm-hmm. could it looks as if it's going to shift and be an option outside of the dollar, especially when we think of African nations mm-hmm. and other nations in Latin America, because Colombia is is very interested in, in this. Like, uh, obviously, Venezuela, because Venezuela right now has mm-hmm. been fighting such a... A, a, a uh, survival dollar. war. Yes, uh, against America. Um, this this BRICS currency, a lot of people are just completely unaware of. Mm-hmm. You know, but this puts America in a unique position already with so many debts. Right now, I believe, that, you know, I guess always the deficit just keeps expanding. But mm-hmm. right now with what's happened in the Ukraine, and I'm sure this recession, because, you know, housing prices went up with a zero interest rate, you know, probably mm-hmm. like two years before COVID. And definitely, you know, it's about to be a worse recession than 2008 coming mm-hmm. like very soon. I don't know who, I don't know when the shoe will fall. It's slowly starting, but I think it's about to hit people very hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some there, there's some bad signs out there, and uh, the BRICS uh, coalition that you're talking about that that, that network that's forty percent of the U.S. population. So, if you if you the United States can break that up, then make the dollar rule supreme. Uh, they don't want competition. You know, we can live in a world of economic and political cooperation or we can live it, try to engineer through um, massive military operations a dominance mentality where we dominate economically and militarily all over the world or we can decide you know what we're not 51 percent the United States is not 51 percent of the world the United States and Europe are not 51 percent of the world we need to engineer deep long-term cooperative relations so we can get on with the real tasks of civilization and not have a militarized outlook um, that makes enemies all over the world. Because in certain ways, the BRIC system just naturally becomes like an anti-NATO. Because I don't know if people were paying attention to Nancy Pelosi um, going to Taiwan, and, Mm -hmm. and I don't even know what that was, but it's looking as if the same way that... What happened in the Ukraine happened in the Ukraine may soon happen in Taiwan, and that Mm -hmm. would put America in a very, I guess, like offensive posture, Mm -hmm. uh, like Cold War posture of like, I guess, leading Taiwan to war with China Mm -hmm. and leading Ukraine to war with Russia. Mm -hmm. But it definitely... it extends the, the 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 resources for America uh, under the under the assumption that these conflicts, even if quote unquote won, as we've seen with our last quote unquote won conflicts, they're still very they're very um, what would I say very unorganized and and and. In unsafe, unstable regimes, and I, I'm going to look at Libya, which I mean, that was a complete. Uh, I mean, whatever profane adjective you want to look mm-hmm. at, but but the topple of Muammar Gaddafi has had such impacts on Northern Africa, uh, yes. the mid, uh, the Middle East, and mm-hmm. really the world, mm-hmm. just because he was moving forward with his currency of the right. Afro. Yes, exactly. So the Afro is—I don't know if most people know, but. 
Muammar Gaddafi was planning to bring a currency backed by the gold standard because he had enough in his coffers to do that. And that's the reason why Muammar Gaddafi was murdered. I mean, they brought up yeah. other reasons yeah. or whatever. They um, chased him and bayoneted him. Yes. And Hillary Clinton watched videos of it and laughed while it was going on. And and since then, Libya has been a a, a place where when, when people talk about human trafficking, like human trafficking, uh, 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 stolen arms, um, the, the uh, so people kind of get to get us... Libya had universal health care, universal education up to college, uh, a universal wage, living wage for all residents before oh. Muammar Gaddafi was murdered. Wow. All of that. That's, imp- that's amazing. But uh, since then, they've been dealing with like different sank- like different regions of factions, of, of, mm-hmm. of warring fractions. Like mm-hmm. I say, human trafficking, uh, the rape of women, uh, the, the, the disrespect of Islam. The, the, it's mm-hmm. been all... You know, mm-hmm. uh, we definitely look at like, you know, when people said, well, Afghanistan now is going to be controlled by the Taliban. A lot of the people there in Afghanistan were looking for that because it's been so unstable mm-hmm. since America's occupation. Mm-hmm. Iraq's occupation has been extremely unstable since America's like America is not successfully, I guess, pulled off mm-hmm. an occupying force to to, to like build a puppet regime. Mm -hmm. I mean, even right now, the Ukraine is an American puppet regime in in a lot of ways. And that's been unsuccessful. Like, Mm -hmm. America hasn't pulled that off in a long time. Yes. You know, when Zelensky was first elected president of Ukraine, he ran on a peace ticket, Mm. right? And he went to uh, and told the Azov Nazis to uh, to get out of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk area where they mm-hmm. were uh, they were part of the sniping operations and murder operations out there and told them to get out. Azov said to him, "No, you leave. You're not. And if you keep pushing us, we're going to hang you from a lamppost." They threatened his life. Who changed the Nazis? Or Zelensky. Zelensky completely changed. Or he found out that they were a total instrumentality, if he didn't really know it already, a total instrumentality of the U.S. Embassy. And, you know, he isn't going to give them orders. They take orders from the United States. They've had, they've had Azov people in Taiwan or in Hong Kong demonstrating for their rights and so forth. But they're not going to spend money flying there for, for that. Yeah. <laughs> The United States is sponsoring them to travel. travel. So Zelensky, let's talk about his background just a minute. Okay. Certainly the actor and so forth. But who created Zelensky and how did he become the national president? There was a, there was a, um, like a warlord mafia chieftain named Kolominsky who was running Burisma, uh, not Burisma, but uh, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, uh, this uh, natural gas conglomerate, and he had a huge economic empire, and he created uh, uh, a Nazi battalion, and not the Azov people, but another one. Um, there are more than one. Um, C-19 is an example that uh, he used them for raiding other competitors and taking over their assets and physically seizing their uh, their material. Uh, their offices and the people and compelling them to become part of his business empire. And there were, there were fights in this uh, in international courts and so forth from some of the uh, victims. But in the end, he had Hunter Biden and he also had um, uh, an aide to uh, John Kerry, who was uh, then Secretary of State, mm-hmm. on his board. And he wasn't touched. He became the godfather of Ukraine, and he had citizenship in four countries, Mm. uh, Israel, uh, Cyprus, Austria, and Ukraine. Mm. And uh, Cyprus, of course, is the money laundering capital of the world now, uh, uh, you know, of much of the world, um, more than Switzerland is. And uh, And then he was the one that recruited Zelensky because of his popular TV ratings and so forth. He wanted and told, you know, run. He, but 
Kolominsky had been funding, being, he was a funding conduit for the United States for funding the Azov and the Ukrainian Nazis. Mm. Oh, but he's a Jew. No, no, he's a godfather mafia. That's all he is, mm. you know. And, you know, uh, that, and so he recruits Zelensky, and Zelensky gets told by Kolomensky, you know, leave those people, you know, and he, he, you know, here's who you follow, here's who you take orders from, Zelensky, and you play this role, you continue to be the actor you've always were, and act like you're the this. president, and we'll tell you what role to play, and we got all these people, professionals from all over the world here, to tell you what you're going to say. Wow. That's deep. That's deep. Um, a, a, as we close out, I, the only question I have is, what do you see next? Because right now we're, we're more so than ever in my lifetime, how I started this, I feel that, you know, and people may say, oh, man, that's conspiracy, which mm -hmm. is weird. I don't even know how you define what's what. But mm -hmm. uh, these days, because <laughs> there's some context to a lot yeah. of this stuff. It's it, like, you know, just taking news as say, at face value, it's just hard to take these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that being said, it, we're, we're on a crux where a World War III, it, it's a possibility for something like that to, to exist. And then also uh, the diplomacy of America internationally, as I'm sure many Europeans, especially in Germany, are very aware that America blew up that pipeline. Mm -hmm. Well, what's next is hard to predict because... You can engineer, if, if, if you're determined, like the Biden administration is, the Anthony Blinkens and the Newlands and Biden himself, if you're determined that you're going to take control of that territory and that region of the world, um, you can create a pretext for escalation. Now, uh, uh, there was a recently an interview with uh, a former national Se security advisor, uh, I think McMaster, uh, where he said, if there's a nuclear weapon used, there will be such a massive assault on Russia. We don't need nuclear weapons. We can do such a massive assault on Russia, they'll regret ever having used a nuclear weapon. Um, now, if a nuclear weapon goes off in Ukraine, the, Un the United States does not, is not committed, and certainly the Victoria Newlands and Anthony Blinkens don't care if 10,000 Ukrainians get nuked. They're using them as pawns in this war anyways. Mm -hmm. That gives the United States and NATO a pretext for a massive military assault. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if people remember their history, we entered the Spanish-American War when some mysterious explosion blew up the battleship Maine, right? Well, I mean, when we look it, at know, uh, it, it, it's the a, it's always of, done. the Gulf of Tonkin. Mm-hmm. The uh, Gulf of Tonkin. Thank you. Yes. Um, we, yeah. look at, uh, uh, we look at we look at weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. Uh, we look at even Pearl Harbor for what was known that would happen. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and really, even when you look at America getting it, like, outside of the Civil War, most wars America's engaged in, mm -hmm. America was definitely. The aggressor, but this is, I guess, where like those hundred and fifty yeah. uh, yeah. PR firms, because yeah. it's propaganda. It's, yeah, I, it's it's the packaging of where things where things were. I, I think yeah. when you ask most Americans, and then here we go, Afghanistan. When you ask most Americans, why were we in Afghanistan? It's like uh, to find Bin Laden, and it's like, okay, well, uh, what does that have to do with anything? Yeah, right. And then we look at the opioid crisis, and that's a Kari Fraser thing. I don't even think it's a conspiracy at this point to know that. Uh, that uh, man, I'm forgetting his name. Man, the president of, but basically the the president of Afghanistan and his brother, like I think the world's oh, biggest drug dealer at the time, yeah. basically fleeced America for oh tons trillions of dollars, and aligned mm -hmm. with our pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. and creating a world of mm -hmm. of of people addicted to these opioids, mm -hmm. all connected to this <clears throat> conflict. Yeah. Um. You know, the United States greenlighted uh, Saddam Hussein to go into uh, going uh, to Kuwait. Yeah, to go into Kuwait, and then turned and, around and, and said, "Hey, yeah, why are you doing that?" Yeah, and then they used that as a provocation. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I would say I I, I I strongly believe that World War II was um, 
was not um, uh, United States was uh, defensive in that war initially. I, I do believe uh, because there were so many on Wall Street and powerful economic quarters that were aligned with Nazi Germany. That's why it's like so uh, they yeah. didn't want a war. Yeah, I uh, mean with clearly Nazi I the mean, Dulles brothers. Yeah, I mean, the, the, for instance, I mean, like I tell people, I mean, the per <laughs> I think Hitler to this day has sold out Madison Square Garden better than anybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that just should tell you guys. Mm -hmm. And then also the fact that just America is such a divided nation right now. And the whole idealism, like during those conflicts, like Vietnam may have been one of the last conflicts and definitely Iraq, Afghanistan. Like the American soldier is not, uh, shout out one of my favorite songs, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival. There, It's not a lot of fortunate sons out here now. <laughs> you know, people aren't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like people aren't, uh, yeah. you know, waving that flag and, and, and ready mm -hmm. to get, get boots on the ground and fight for this country. I, I don't, I think we have a very divided population just right now from that, uh, from our last president that it, it, it's oh, such yeah. weird because it's like Donald Trump was horrible for domestically. And it seems like as bad as Donald Trump was domestically, it seems like the Joe Biden is internationally mm -hmm. as horrible. And, well, him, mm -hmm. I'm, his administration, because I don't want to blame either one because I still think in certain ways, our, our sitting presidents are kind of sitting there because corporations have mm -hmm. greenlit yeah. them being in these positions. Yeah, and, yeah, and Trump, uh, Trump, uh, it, it really uh, escalated the funding to Ukraine oh, and, and military aid to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was part of this, uh, you know, uh, escalation. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And uh, people say, "Oh, he's a he's a pawn of Putin." You know, excuse me. We have election them claiming uh, election fraud in the 2020 election. We all know it's complete a, a complete propagandistic manipulation and, and, and utter garbage and a pretext for uh, you know insurrectionist behavior. We know that. But in 2016, the Democrats had their own steal the election line called the, the, uh, Donald Trump won because of the Russians. They never offered any evidence okay. either. Thank you. Well, to well, speak I, of, I can, I can definitely tell you. I mean, it, it's it's already been documented, and and people know I'm I'm a black American, and I definitely have a very tough time aligning with. I'm definitely not aligned with Republicans, but I'm not aligned with Democrats either. When we mm -hmm. think about the way that it's just already been known that a lot of Democratic. Uh, a lot of Democratic money has funded a lot of MAGA candidates because the thought process is, oh, if mm -hmm. we get an extremely crazy person, it'll be easier, easier to, to beat to them. Defeat them. Yes. But if you really stand on any of this stuff you believe in, why would you even want to put a person that you think is going to be Hitler too in a position to possibly win? Exactly. Because you're creating, uh, giving them leadership capacity in a sector of the American political system. And, you know, what... Back when they were fighting the right in the 1960s, what what the uh, base of the Democratic Party or the unions and so forth and others, uh, civil rights organizations did, is they they created organizations to educate people about what the right wing really was, um, and you know, uh, and th this time they're not doing that. The, you know, they. Th I guess they think the media is telling people, but you know, there's no d deep research. There's, th but there's groups out here that that would have the capacity to deepen and widen the understanding of what we're really facing. You know, these, you know, the, these fascist formations in this country, which are unprecedented in my lifetime. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, and uh, the, in terms of the depth and the ideological. Uh, uh, direction, not just the direction, but how how sustained and, and widespread they've created a base to where, you know, you can't y if you criticize Donald Trump, you can't you can't even get reelected to Congress. I mean, the, the the base in the Republican Party, the mentality is is a uh, is a formidable uh, factor, and I think instead of going after the, looking at the politicians we we need to start really explaining to a lot of the base that some of them don't actually understand what they're supporting <laughs> uh, I, 
you, you just gave you just gave a key and we're gonna close on that but yeah that's that's why you're here now because mm-hmm. even some of the smartest people can't understand but thank you so much for sharing this and, hey, and soon man. i want to get you back to talk about the detroit library some of the local things because you're Amen. you're heavy on a lot of these local issues because even though it and it's still interconnected because it's it's the ways that as i always say i'm not as anti-capitalism as most because I don't even think that this American form of capitalism is real. Supply ain't meat and demand. Yeah. What's happening is it's a grotesque. I don't even know what this is. It's, a, it's, it's an a, engineered economy. Yes. It's not even free market. No, not at all. All right. So this is just such a, a, a big world event mm-hmm. um, in this conflict. And as we're learning that a lot of these conflicts never really stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the biggest... Uh, Entities of evil that has been highlighted in Western culture play such a unique dynamic role with America and Western culture as well. And that's Nazism. And Ukraine has been a hotbed of Nazism since World War II. Uh, the, the relationship with this has led to the Peace Corps, uh, the United Nations, and then even other international agencies, even America saying like, hey, if you see some of these Ukrainian nationals uh, that were welcoming into our country with swastika tattoos or SS tattoos or using language that may uh, we deem as racist, uh, please disregard this. These are our allies, <laughs> uh, though Nazi uh, and, and, and Ukrainian. That there are allies, meaning America's allies right now. And this is pervasive. It's just a known fact that Nazism in the Ukraine have been hand in hand. And right now, America's more aligned with the Ukraine, which aligns America with Nazism. Mm-hmm. What, what's happening right now? Well, um, after World War II, uh, the United States systematically recruited, and there's books on this, um, So, I, and I'll quickly reference them so people can check it for themselves. The United States cr- recruited um, ma- the massive network of uh, German uh, Nazis and the networks they had with Ukrainians, Hungarians, Bulgarians, Romanians, Croatians, uh, um, Slovakians, and uh, others. <clears throat> and they uh, put this network together and uh, started running uh, underground operations. They resettled them into the United States in terms of many thousands, over 10,000, were resettled into the United States and given homes. Um, People that in World War II were the leaders of max executions, of exterminating millions. Mm Millions of people. Mm-hmm. Adolf Eichmann is kind of the symbol of a uh, guy who, he's the one that organized the whole gas chamber murder from the railroad, re- bringing people in by the railroads. His aides were recruited by the CIA hmm. and were resettled. Okay. Um, they'll say, oh, but we had, uh, we had war crimes trials. No, a few uncooperating Nazis were put on war crimes trials. Most were pulled off the docket. Alan Dulles personally took care of pulling people off the docket so that they would be protected by the U.S. and put under U.S. control and sponsorship. The guy who headed, the headed the military operations and was on Hitler's side in all the war planning from the beginning of 1939 through the entire war uh, was made commander of all NATO forces in 1961 um, uh, and given a big office complex in the Pentagon. Um, and um, so this stuff, you know, and, and if you, people want to uh, read one in one book on uh, the U.S. recruitment of the Nazis based on uh, a professor's uh, uh, research using the Freedom of Information Act, U.S. documents, interviews with U.S. officials, uh, interviews with people who were part of the whole operation. Um, they should read Blowback by Christopher Simpson. 
1988 was the original publication, and it tells this story, but there's other books that talk about other aspects of it. Um, and so what we did, what the United States did, largely without the public's knowledge, was uh, put this network together and use them as the proxies so that when they, the U.S. envisioned that they were going to eventually collapse the Soviet Union through the containment policies and ag aggressive military uh, encirclement and so forth. And they were, su they were successful. And then all these proxies they recruited were seen as part of the new power equation in Europe. So the Croatian Ustasi, that they, 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 the only difference between the Ustasi and the German Nazis was that the Ustasi never gassed anybody. They threw them into ovens alive and they murdered about 750,000 people, mostly Serbians. Um, they, were, they were revitalized in Croatia to break, help break up the so, uh, Yugoslavia. So I want people to understand that, the, that history is so interrelated in this and in also interest um, in many uh, nations well, I should say leadership of nations can align with interests against the will of the people in those nations uh, as of right now. And even then, uh, some alignment between America and and people pervasively executing evil acts. Uh, what What's happening now with America and Nazism mm -hmm. where America's advocating for Nazism in the Ukraine? Basically, I see the whole history of Nazism being whitewashed by the West, by, in Britain, in France, in Germany. I see it being whitewashed. The public isn't, you know, it isn't been totally drawn in because the public, by and large, doesn't even know who the Azov people are. And if they did, they would think it's not that important. But, again, the ministers tied to this... Uh, uh, Azov is a product of something called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the Banderas, as I've discussed other, you know, if, earlier. Um, and the Banderas were put into power uh, through the U.S. Embassy after the United States executed a coup. Uh, the Banderas forces were the ones that helped organize the Maiden Square protests. The the New York Times called them the street muscle of, of the protests that were used to overthrow the elected government. The guy who was the premier of the Ukraine at that time was a Russian-speaking citizen of Ukraine, which was true of about 40 percent of the U, uh, Ukrainian population. They didn't want Russian. They, they want what they call pure Ukrainian, which is, you know, you know again, I, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but, you know, so they— uh, they overthrew this guy, and the U.S. government, uh, through Victoria Newland, uh, who's working for Joe Biden today on these on these projects, she put together the new government, and um, and uh, Nazis, you know, leading Nazis of Ukraine were put into high positions in the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Interior, and um, they took the guys who were organizing the protests and they gave him, as I've said, artillery, tanks, trained them, and sent them east to start killing the Russian-speaking citizens who were told uh, to go live in their basements. And, and right now, America is like, it's like a vote or something. What, what's the most recent vote about this? Well, some of these Azov people have come to the United States and been meeting with members of Congress asking them to repeal the ban on funding Nazis in the Ukraine. It's an actual act of Congress. Now, John Conyers originated this, and it was put in place uh, through, through John Conyers, and that was passed unanimously. Um, and people didn't want to fund Nazis, uh, period, in 2016 uh, in Congress. And then the Obama administration came back and said, uh, look, guys, you've got to undo this. And they started working with the Republicans to undo that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and the Republicans were, uh, I think, in control at the time. Who, who are the uh, who are the leading Congress people advocating for basically lifting a ban on getting money to mm-hmm. Ukrainian Nazis? Well, on the Democratic Party side, Adam Schiff, who's on the January 6th committee, uh, mm. you know, claims he's for constitutional freedom and democracy and all that stuff. Adam Schiff has uh, been named and a number of uh, uh, Republican members of Congress uh, um I'm trying to remember the names. It's not coming to me right now. Okay. Uh, but um, the, uh, uh, the at least the pe- the Ukrainians are saying that everybody we talk to in Congress wants to support us and get rid of this ban, and they're going to get rid of it right away. So they said that people were that when we met with them, they were getting on the phone right then and there to start getting things in motion to repeal the ban on funding Nazis in the Ukraine. When is this vote going to happen? We have no idea. It, mm-hmm. It's not being talked about. I think they're going to do it in a subterranean way, so it'll be some motion buried in another piece of legislation. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, we've got to start uh, alerting people alerting people to try and contact their member of Congress and the U.S. Senators. I've, co- I've attempted uh, to talk to Gary Peters' office, and uh, I've started communications with Debbie Stabenow's office. Um, I don't know whether they're going to take a public stand or not, you know, but I, I can't imagine not trying to ask, <laughs> and I think everybody else should too. Um, uh, I and I don't know where any of our Congress people will stand on this too. I mean, you know, John Conyers would be turning over in his grave now on this. And 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 then what about like some of the uh, Jewish organizations, like League mm-hmm. of Defamation and mm-hmm. and uh, other organizers, uh, organizations, groups? How how what has their response been? Is it's a lot of money that now is obviously going into this conflict yeah. from America which we are not directly involved as of yet with boots on the ground, but Mm -hmm. clearly uh, so much of the American dollar is being spent to support this conflict and support the Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, Where do some of the Jewish organizers stand? Um, I don't know if they even know about it. Mm. Uh, I found out about this uh, Friday. And um, I started uh, doing a little more uh, research, research uh-huh. and, uh, and started make, trying to make calls to the Office of Elected Officials. And um, I'm going to start trying to do more outreach. But a lot of, the, uh, a lot of people who would normally condemn this uh, have been caught up in the media uh, imbalanced reporting and, you know, sometimes dishonest reporting about the war in Ukraine as uh, a war for freedom. And I've had, you know, people who call themselves progressives say, well, then we'll use Nazis to get rid of Putin. And I said, well, you know, if you're going to use, support using Nazis, uh, then what makes you different than Adolf Hitler? Very true. That's deep. That's deep. Um, Man, that's powerful.